mentioned, we're doing our second webinar of three webinars. This one is on types of fall protection, including guardrails. And then the next webinar will be on fall protection plan and system implementation. So we won't be able to cover everything today, but there's still some things to look forward to in the next webinar. So as Crystal mentioned, my name is Brendan Kerber. I'm a senior engineer with High Engineering, and I'll be giving the presentation today. So what we'll be talking about, we'll look at fall protection plan and training requirements just briefly as kind of an overview. Then we'll get into the hierarchy of controls in terms of how do we select different types of systems. And then we'll look at the different types of systems. So guardrails, travel restraint systems, all of our systems, and then other control options. And in the pre-webinar survey, I know some of you received most of these responses indicated uh, people were looking for information on types of equipment and legislative requirements. So we'll try and cover uh, responses to those inquiries as much as we can. Um, in this webinar, we're primarily looking at the different types of systems. So as we've listed here, guardrails, travel strength, and ball arrest. So I'll give a brief description of what kind of equipment you can use with with each of those systems. Uh, but the main intention is just to provide an overview of these different types of systems to allow you to better select what the most appropriate system is for your specific use case. And then some questions you can possibly ask when you're deciding or when asking a contractor about what system to use. And then, as I mentioned, webinar three, we'll talk about system implementation. So we'll have some more details on some of the specifics, particularly for travel restraint and fall arrest systems. So as we get started, I just want to have a disclaimer. This webinar is for information only. It's only intended to raise awareness, help you kind of gain an initial understanding of the different fall protection systems. It's not legal advice. I'm not providing legal insight into the OHS code or what you need to do for your specific uh, location or specific use case. And then when you are using fall protection, it does require in depth training. So this webinar is not a training session, it's just information. If you do want to use a system, you should consult an authorized training provider. They can provide you the detailed training you need in order to use the system safely and implement it safely at your facility. So as we get started, we'll start with a brief review from webinar one. So webinar number one was about hazard identification and slips, trips, and falls. We talked about identifying hazards, hazards of identification. We talked about the OHS requirements. Uh, you know, the main thing is an employer must provide a hazard assessment and that employees must participate in that assessment. So we talked about things like the energy wheel, uh, ways to identify risk. Then we talked about recognizing different fall hazards. So things like proximity to the hazard, height, landing area. We had numerous different categories that we can use to recognize and classify these hazards. And then we looked at common hazards specific to aquatic centers. We had an example, which was actually this picture here of how we would identify and classify hazards at this location. So if that's something you're interested in, I would recommend uh, go back. As Crystal mentioned, it's recorded on the website. So you can go and view that at any time you wish, just as a refresher or if you missed it. So looking at the regulations, uh, fall protection is governed in part nine of the Alberta OHS code. And it states that an employer must ensure you are protected from falling if you may fall in any of these following situations. So if any of these are true. So if you could fall a vertical distance of three meters or 10 feet or more, if you could fall a distance of less than three meters or 10 feet on any surface other than a flat solid surface. So that's, you know, if it's a jagged surface, it's uneven, it's onto machinery, anything like that that's not flat and solid. If you could fall onto a hazardous substance or object, so, you know, that could be into a machine, into some kind of chemical pit, or anything that would pose a hazard other than, again, that solid flat surface. Or if you could fall through an opening. And then finally, if you could fall a vertical distance of 1.2 meters or four feet or more, if it's a permanent working. 
So in any of those situations, if that applies to you, you'd have some kind of protection from falling. That's what we're going to get into in this webinar. Okay. We know we need some kind of protection. What can we use? And then another thing we talked about as part of webinar one a little bit is also in part nine, it states, as we see on the slide here, an employer must ensure that a worker uses an appropriate fall protection system in combination with a life jacket or personal flotation device if the worker may A, fall into water that exposes the worker to a hazard of drowning, or B, could drown from falling into the water from other than a boat. So we talked about this briefly in webinar one, but an interesting point that we didn't necessarily get into as much detail is how does this apply to lifeguards? Lifeguards work at pools, there's water, they can fall into the water. Do they need a life jacket? And again, I wanna say that this is informative only. This is kind of my interpretation. It's not necessarily binding regulation. So I would recommend if you need to know more specific details, consult legal team, consult OHS representative, and you can also consult the Life Safety Society, which provides National Lifeguard Certificate. Um, unfortunately, because I'm not a member of the Life Saving Society, I don't know all their training rules. I did try and look it up and couldn't find it. Uh, but in terms of the OHS regulations, my interpretation would be at the start of Part 9, it has an exemption for rescue personnel. It states that you know, anyone providing emergency rescue services may use other means than what's listed in this part. So I would consider a lifeguard someone who's providing emergency rescue. Their whole purpose of being there is to rescue someone if they get into trouble in the water. And therefore, because of their training and their skills, they have other skills that mean they may not necessarily need to follow all the regulations of this part. But then I would also recommend that only applies to when they're performing their duties as a lifeguard. So if they're on duty, patrolling, watching for swimmers in the water, they can follow their standard practice, which typically would not be to have a life jacket. But if they're doing some other task, you know, it may be the lifeguard, but maybe the lifeguard on the pool is closed and they're helping do some maintenance or some painting or some cleaning. They're not performing tasks as a lifeguard. Their main task is now to clean or to paint. Then they probably should have the requirements as part of this part. So, you know, a fall protection system, maybe a life jacket, because in that case, they're focusing on cleaning, not on rescuing someone. So they're no longer functioning under that rescue example. Again, if you have, that's my interpretation. I, I would recommend consulting you know, the other regulations like Life Saving Society, or if you have more questions, you can always ask them at the end of this webinar and we can discuss a little more. Now we'll look at the fall protection plan and training requirements. So the fall protection plan is identified in section 140 under part nine of the OHS code. And it states that if a worker may fall three meters, 10 feet or more, and is not protected by guardrails, they need a fall protection plan. So the employer is responsible to develop this plan and they must make it available at the work site. And then once it's available, all workers must review the plan before any work begins. And the plan must be updated when any conditions change. So one important thing to note is that this plan is only required if the worker may fall three meters or more and is not protected by guardrails. But as we saw earlier, there are other conditions that may require fall protection, but not necessarily a fall protection plan. So for example, if you're only falling two meters, but it's onto or into a hazardous substance, you would still require a fall protection system, but not strictly speaking require a fall protection plan. I would still recommend you have a plan so you know how to use that system, but per the regulations, you don't necessarily need it. And then again, all of that would be determined by your hazard assessment, which we talked about in the first webinar. So when you do your hazard assessment, you should identify what the hazards are, what protection you need, and then you should verify that with the OHS regulations and determine what kind of plan you need. Even if you don't need all the parts of this fall protection plan, 
you might still need some of them. And then Alberta OHS, they actually have posted a guide with a template. So there's a QR code here. So I'll leave that up for a minute. So if you want, you can scan the QR code. That'll take you to the Government of Alberta website. And you can see their explanatory guide on a fall protection plan. You can view the template. And that just gives you a template you can work through, you can fill out, you don't have to develop it all from scratch. And again, this will be discussed in a lot more detail in the next webinar. But that's kind of the brief intro. We know we need a fall protection system. We likely need a plan with some of the systems we're going to talk about next. Next, we want to talk about training. So this is in the next section, section 141. It states that an employer must ensure all workers are trained. The workers must be trained in safe use of fall protection systems. And workers must be made aware of the fall hazards at the work site and any methods to eliminate or control those hazards. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to talk about training. Training is a whole broad topic. We'll probably spend multiple webinars on it. I would recommend in looking at training, find a reputable training provider. There are many out there. One thing that is a common question is, does the training need to be in person? Can we just do online training? Online or recorded training has been a thing. Even since before COVID, but now with COVID for sure, everyone's familiar with online training. And that's a difficult question. The one thing I will say is that there's a CSA standard, CSA Z259.19, which is all about managed fall protection training. And it provides recommendations for what needs to be included in a training plan, um, what needs to be in the training, um, how to train for different types of systems. And it also talks about in-person or e-learning training, e-learning being online training. And it does say that e-learning is not an acceptable delivery method for a complete training program. Um, e-learning is only really applicable for procedural knowledge. Um, it doesn't really help with you know, the hands-on practical parts, which are important because fall protection is hands-on and practical. So based on that, I would recommend you need to have some component at least, maybe not the whole thing, but at least some component that's in-person. So now we've talked about, we know we need a fall protection system. We know we need some uh, fall protection plan. We know we need some training. How do we determine what kind of fall protection system we need? The best way to do that is to look at what's known as the hierarchy of controls. So there's, this is an example of a standard hierarchy. It's actually codified in section nine. You should note section nine is different than part nine. So this is section nine of the OHMS code. And it has something similar to this. So first thing you need to eliminate or control the hazard. And then we move down the inverted pyramid. So we start with elimination. Then we can do substitution. So elimination just means we get rid of the hazard altogether. Usually that's done through building design at the construction phase and the design phase. For our purposes, usually there's not a lot of options for elimination. Then we have the option for substitution. So that's, you know, maybe we can change our work practices a little. So we can substitute some equipment or some procedures. So we might still be working at height, but it's less risky. Again, risk being based on how we did the hazard system. After that, we look at engineering controls. So those are things uh, that are engineered in the system. A great example of an engineering control is a guardrail. It's an engineered system. It's kind of an add-on or an extra feature that's built in, but it is that. It's built in or engineered in that controls the hazard, protects us from the hazard. Then there's administrative controls. So those would be things, if anyone's familiar with lockout and hangout procedures, where you will physically apply a lock so that something cannot be used. You know, maybe when your pool is drained, you lock the doors so that only authorized personnel can get it. That would be an example of an administrative control. And then our final step 
is PPE, which is personal protective equipment. So that would be something like your traditional fall arrest system. You need to put on a harness, connect a lanyard, connect that lanyard to an anchor point. Those are all parts of your protective equipment. And as you can see with the arrows, as we move down the pyramid, it requires increasing training and supervision. You know, if we start at the top, if the hazard's eliminated, we don't need any training because there's no hazard to train for. And then as we move down, once we get down to the bottom with personal protective equipment, we need a lot of training to know how to put on the harness, how to connect, which land you're doing, select, how do we connect it to an anchor? What is an appropriate anchor? There's a lot more training involved. And we also see in the green arrow that as we stay towards the top of that pyramid, we have increasing effectiveness and sustainability. Again, with elimination, it's very effective because the fall is eliminated, we can't fall. Whereas PPE, it can still be very effective, but it just, again, requires all that training. And because of that training and all the equipment involved, it's not necessarily as sustainable because we need to replace equipment. We need to do equipment inspections. There's all these additional steps that are required. And then the code specifically states that we may only use a lesser means if it's not reasonably practicable. So for example, we want to use guardrails, but it's not practicable. We use those. Only then are we allowed to use something like a fall arrest system. And just for reference, practicable, as defined in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, that means being capable of being put into practice or being done or accomplished, or a synonym would be feasible. So, you know, if there's no reasonable way to use a guardrail, then we can justify moving to a fall arrest system. We just can't say, here's a harness, go do all your work, because that might not actually be the best solution. And then just one example on elimination or substitution. As I mentioned, you might change your practice. So this is an example from our old office, actually. Every year in the spring, someone would come out, wash the windows. The one year, you know, they came out, washed the windows off a ladder. You're working on a ladder, so you are at a hazard of falling. And then a great way to substitute your work practice is the next year, and then for several years after that, they came out and they just used a long extension pole. So, you know, the windows are still there. You still need to get up to the height of the windows, but they just adjusted their work task a little, substituted some equipment. You know, they substituted a long pole for a ladder. And now their worker is no longer at height. He can work safely. He doesn't need any kind of special fall protection procedures or emergency response plan. He just needs a long pole. So that's a great example. Depending on what your situation is, that may or may not be practical. And then in part nine, so section 139 of the fall protection code, it actually provides a fall protection hierarchy. So what we saw originally was the general hierarchy of controls in section nine, which applies to any occupational health and safety activity. Fall protection hierarchy applies specifically to fall protection systems. So when we need that fall protection, you know, falling three meters or there's a hazardous substance or any of those conditions. So it states, first off, use a guardrail. If that's not practicable, which we define, then you can use a travel restraint system. If that's not practicable, then you can use a fall arrest system. And if none of those three options are practicable, then you can use other equally effective controls, which we will define what those are at the end of this presentation, because that is a very vague term. But we'll start with guardrails. So guardrails. You can have permanent guardrails. This would be something, you know, it's permanent. So it's permanently installed at your facility. The Alberta OHS code has requirements for the dimensions and the strength. So, as you can see in the picture here, we've got top rail, mid rail, a tow board, different height requirements, different spacing requirements. That's all defined in the OHS code. Because it's a permanent system, it would need to be fabricated and installed, likely by a contractor. So when you're hiring a contractor, you want to make sure they are providing a guardrail that meets the OHS code. So for a kind of a helpful guide, I've just put together a brochure on guardrails and then also on tow board requirements. So there's two QR codes there. If you want, you can scan those. 
The information is also available on our AMSIS website. So you can go there, it's at the bottom under documents. You can download those and those will give you guidelines of what to compare. You get multiple quotes from multiple contractors. You can look at them, you can ask, hey, does it have the right height? Does it have the right strength? Does it have the right deflection criteria? And that's listed out there so you can compare different quotes. Another thing to think about with guardrails is um, how to attach it. The contractor will have all kinds of different options in terms of, is it a socket into the concrete? Is it a bolt-on connection? Is it a platform? There's a huge variety of options there. So that's something that we discuss with the contract. One other thing to consider with permanent guardrails is do they need to be building code compliant? The building code requirements are more stringent than the OHS requirements. And that's because the building code applies to all public areas. So, you know, at aquatic centers, it's a public area. It's open to the general public for all the patrons who are going to come swimming and down the water slides and the aquatic park and all those things. So if we're installing permanent guardrails, there's a good chance they might need to be building code compliant. So in the picture you see here, kind of along the back wall, you can see there's a raised wall above the pool surface. And it's a little hard to see, but there is a guardrail there and it's got glass infill panels. And that would be building code compliant as well as OTS code compliant. So that's something to consider is, you know, maybe you can add a guardrail and it will just protect people 100% of the time, all the time. It doesn't need to be just for your workers. It may need to be for your pool patrons as well. So that's important fact to consider is if it's a public area, it probably needs to be building code and OHS compliant. Whereas if it's just something in a maintenance room, it might not need all the stringent requirements of the building. Again, that's something if you're hiring contractors, they should be able to help. If not, you can always contact an engineer or an architect and they'll be able to navigate you between when is one code required, when are both required, which one's required where. And again, I'll provide my contact information at the end of this show. If you want to call us, we're very happy to help you with those questions as well. The next option, which I know a lot of people are interested in, is temporary guardrails. So this would be something that, you know, you don't have them permanently installed, but when you close to do maintenance or when you drain the pool or, you know, in the evenings, you've got a, an area you need to work on, what kind of guardrails can you put up just temporarily provide protection for a couple hours, and then take them down. So the OHS code does not have any specific requirements for temporary guardrails. They need to follow all the same requirements as permanent guardrails. So the same requirements for height, for mid rails, for strength, there's no differentiation. But for temporary guardrails, there is a CSA standard, the Z259.18, the Dash 19 is published in 2019, the standard for counterweighted guardrail systems. Uh, now, unfortunately, to date, I don't know any systems that are actually certified to the system or to the standard, but hopefully in the future, this will be a great reference where manufacturers will certify the system to the standard. And then, you know, it's got a CSA standard. It's been tested to all the requirements of that standard and it's safe. Um, right now, because no systems are certified, you need to ask more specific questions of the manufacturer. And when you do that, you also need to make sure when it's installed, you follow all the manufacturer's instructions. I've seen several systems where they will work, but only when installed correctly. They need the proper number of counterweights. Sometimes they need uh, returns and the proper number of corners and the proper spacing of posts and returns. If you just do one straight run, it may not necessarily work. And another important thing to do is to ask when you're selecting different manufacturers is ask and review their test reports. They should have some kind of test report or design report telling you how their system functions. So for example, one system in their test report, and I won't tell you whose system this is, but one system, uh, they did testing to a 200 pound load to meet the OHS requirements. And the system started sliding. So in the test report, it requires that the bottom of the guardrails be blocked. You know, it has some kind of footing or extra counterweights to stop it from sliding. 
Now, if the system's installed on a roof and there's you know a parapet, maybe there's six foot or 12 in, or uh, sorry, six inch or 12 inch parapet, the guardrail system can sit against that parapet and that'll prevent it from sliding all day. And then it will resist turning over. That's great. Um, but because we're working in aquatic environments, you know, let's say this is on the edge of an empty pool, there's no blocking or parapet or anything that's going to stop that system from sliding. Um, so that's something to look into, ask manufacturers about, because some systems do not need that extra blocking, while some do. So we want to make sure we select a system that doesn't need extra blocking, or if it does, we're able to provide that extra blocking to prevent it from sliding. And then the other thing to ask about is, is it suitable for the pool surface or the whatever surface we're putting on? Maybe it's not a pool, but whatever surface it's on. A lot of these systems are tested for roofs, or you know, they can be membrane roofs, asphalt roofs, concrete roofs. So some of them I expect will work great in aquatic environments where it's a very low friction, wet, slippery surface but some may not because they may not be suitable for that low friction slippery surface. So again, something check, you know, find out what your pool surface is. Is it concrete? Is it tile? Is it plastic? Is it some other material? And then make sure the system will work on it. And if they don't know, you can always do testing. Again, either the manufacturer or the contractor may be able to do that, or you might need to contact an engineer. And the last thing to discuss about guardrails is the plan and the training. So we talked about we may need a fall protection plan and training. In this case, a fall protection plan is not required. The regulation specifically stated it's only required if they are not protected by guardrails. So in this case, if you can install a guardrail, you don't need a fall protection plan. But you may need the plan if you're setting up temporary guardrails because before that temporary guardrail is set up, they are at that hazard of falling and they're not protected by guardrails. So you don't need the plan for using the guardrail system, but you may need the plan for setup and takedown and everything in between. And then training, the basic, it's a little simplistic, but the basic thing is don't climb over the guardrail. So in the picture here, you see there's these boys jumping into the lake or the, the bay. They've obviously climbed over the guardrail. It is no longer protecting them, and they are freely jumping or falling into the water. The main way that guardrails work is you don't climb over them, and they protect you and prevent you from falling. Uh, this is important because it also means not, you know, just climbing up on the tow board to get a little bit more reach. That's unfortunately a common practice, is especially in man lifts. They've got a guardrail. Oh, I just need to reach a little farther so I'm going to step up on the tow board or, you know, step up on a little step. Once you start doing that, there's a chance you can fall over the top of the guardrail. So that's the basic thing. Don't climb on them. Don't kind of counteract what they do. They have a specific height requirement. If you climb up, it doesn't meet that height requirement, so it's no longer effective. Next, we will look at travel restraint systems. We'll start by defining what a travel restraint system is. In the OHS regulations, it says that a travel restraint system means a type of fall protection system, including guardrails or similar barriers that prevent a worker from traveling to the edge of a structure or to a work position from which the worker could fall. And then looking at the CSA standards, they state that it is a system that prevents one or more workers from reaching an unprotected edge or opening. And then it goes on to add a note that it couples a worker's body holding device to an anchorage using a suitable means such as a lanyard, um, and that a guardrail is a form of passive travel restraint system. So the basic summary of a travel restraint system is it's some kind of system that prevents you from reaching an edge and therefore you cannot fall. So it prevents the fall from ever occurring. It's something that the employer must provide and that the employer and supervisor are responsible to make sure it functions correct. Now, so a great example of where to use this would be again, at the edge of an empty pool. 
if you imagine the picture here, you can set up some sort of horizontal lifeline or a set of anchor points, connect with a short enough lanyard so that you can't walk to the edge of the pool shown in the diagram. You've got that dashed line, you're restricted within some distance of the edge, but you cannot go past it. The key parts of a travel restraint system are your harness. So your harness, ideally it would be a full body harness. Um, this should be CSA, NC, or EN certified. You need a connecting device. So this is what you use to connect your harness to the anchor. So this could be a lanyard, it could be a self-protecting lifeline, it could be a vertical lifeline. There's a variety of components you could use as this connecting device. Whatever you use, it again should be CSA, ANSI, or EN certified. Then you have your anchorage and anchorage connector and anchorage. So in general terms, this would be our anchor. Anchorage connector and anchorage are more technical terms from the CSA standards. So the anchorage is your actual structural member that's used to resist the loads. So that could be your concrete pool deck, or structural columns, or the ground, if you're anchoring into the ground, whatever your large structural object is. And then the anchorage connector is the interface component that you install on the anchor. So that could be like an eye bolt, or an anchor sling, or a D-ring. So in this picture here, our anchorage would be the flat floor or deck surface. And then our anchorage connector would be these base plates with the post and then the horizontal lifeline system because that's connecting to the anchorage, which is the floor structure. Um, in general terms, that can all be called anchor. Um, the terms are used rather interchangeably and it's somewhat confusing. Uh, we'll get into a lot more details of the requirements for those in terms of strength and connections and where they can be located in Weber 3. Um, but that's the basic overview. And then for travel restraint systems, you need the adjust. So it needs to be adjusted or sized or positioned properly so that it prevents the worker from reaching the edge and prevents the fall from ever occurring. Uh, so this could mean, you know, selecting the right length of lanyard, or if you've got an adjustable system like a vertical lifeline with a rope grab, you need to make sure it's adjusted properly so that you don't extend past the edge of the working area. And then the final part of the system is an emergency plan. So you don't need a rescue plan because the worker won't fall, but you need some kind of plan in case, you know, what happens if this worker gets injured at the edge from some other injury, you know, maybe the tools they're working on, they get injured from that, or the chemicals, or maybe it's just a hot day and they faint. Um, you need to have part of that you need to have a plan for all of those conditions based on what they're doing, what equipment they're using, what their tasks are. Um, and then you need a way of safely retrieving them from the edge because if they become injured at the edge, a second person or a rescue person can't just come and walk freely to this edge because then they're exposed to that fall hazard. Um, so you need a plan of whether a second person can connect to the travel restraint system. You know, maybe you can just pull on their lanyard and drag them back to a safe location. Maybe you've got a second system you can quickly set up or a second system you buy. Whatever it is, you need some kind of plan in case there's an emergency or an injury of some sort. And then again, I have a QR code. So AMSA has a poster that outlines these different parts of the travel restraint system and then gives a brief summary kind of like I went through. So you can scan that, it'll download the PDF for you. And it's in a poster format, so that's something you can post at your facilities as a quick reference of what you need in this travel restraint system if you have. So again, for travel restraint system, the employer must provide it if that's what you're going to use. And the employer and the supervisor, the supervisor acting on behalf of the employer must make sure that it's used and used correctly. And then when it is provided, the worker must make sure they actually use the system and use it in accordance with the plan and the training they've been provided. Employers also in spot responsible to ensure that suitable anchors are provided, which again, anchors we'll get into in webinar three, but just something to note, the employer must 
make sure they are provided. So here's a great picture of a travel restraint system in use. It's not a rooftop system, but it's probably one of the best pictures I've ever seen of a system. And you can see this worker here, he's connected, he's got a full body harness on, he's got a lanyard connected back to an anchor point on the right. And he's about as far as he can possibly get. There's no way he can get closer to that edge. And no matter how he shifts or turns or jumps, he cannot get to that edge and cannot fall over the edge. So that's how a travel restraint system needs to work. In terms of the plan, a fall protection plan is likely required. As I've mentioned a couple of times, if you're falling less than three meters, it may not be strictly required, but you still need instructions on how to use the equipment. So how do you put on a harness? How do you, what lanyard do you use? You still need to know that because if you select the wrong lanyard, it won't function in travel or spinning. Um, so you might not, again, need all the parts of the fall protection plan. You might not need to calculate clearance because it's a travel restraint, but you might need some parts. And best practice would be to include the full plan and then parts that you don't need, you can just cross out or put in a or have a description of why you don't need them. And again, we'll discuss the plan in webinar. In terms of training, detailed training is required because you need to know how to adjust your equipment, what equipment to use, how to check that your equipment is still in good condition. Uh, so any worker using trauma strength system needs to have gone through the proper training. And then our next type of system is a fall arrest system. In the OHNS, this is defined, a personal fall arrest system means personal protective equipment that will stop a worker's fall before the worker hits a surface below the worker. And in the CSA standard, it's defined as an assembly of components that will arrest a worker's fall when properly assembled and used together and when connected to a suitable anchorage. So the basic of this system is that it will allow you to fall, but it's going to catch the fall or arrest the fall before you impact the ground or the next lower level below you. So in the diagram, you could see there's kind of this phantom transparent worker that could be standing working there at the top level surface. And then if they fall, the system's gonna activate, the personal energy absorber might deploy and extend a bit, but then it's going to arrest that fall, stop the worker before they impact the ground. And you see we've got some distance between their feet and the ground, so it safely rested them. They didn't impact the ground. It should have reduced the risk of injury. And as we mentioned before, this should only be used when the other options are not available. So if you cannot use guardrails, if you cannot use a travel restraint system, then you should use a fall arrest system. In an aquatic setting, some good examples might be, you know, if someone's working on the side of a play structure, you know, they might already be off the side of the structure. So there's no way to put up a guardrail or a travel restraint system because they are directly above fall hazard. Another example would be maybe working on a water slide. It's slippery. You might just slip down. Again, there's no way to add guardrails to that. Travel restraint may or may not be practical or practicable. So fall arrest would be a good option. The parts of a fall arrest system, these are very similar to a travel restraint system. So we have a harness. Um, in this case, it has to be a full body harness. There's no other option. We have a connecting device, which will be the same. It could be a lanyard, a self-protecting lifeline, a vertical lifeline. All the same equipment's used. It's just used in a slightly different configuration. In most cases, an energy absorber will be required, which is not necessarily part of the travel strength system. And the energy absorber absorbs the energy and decreases the fall arrest forces on the worker and the anchorage. Anchorage connector and anchorage, same definitions as the travel restraint. Your anchorage connector is what's attached to the surface. And then your anchorage is the strong structural member. So the concrete floor, the beams, the columns, etc. Then where it gets different is our next two points. So we need clearance below the working surface. So this is the distance from the working surface to the ground or whatever obstruction. 
So we need to make sure that the system's actually going to arrest the fall within that clearance distance. Again, that'll be part of your fall protection plan. You can calculate it. As part of any training program, they will teach you how to calculate what your clearance will be. And then you need to go out and measure it, make sure that's acceptable. And then the last part is your rescue plan. So in this case, because the worker can actually fall and will be left suspended off the system, you need a plan to rescue them once they're hanging in the air. So that needs to be fully developed before using the system. And again, in your training program, they'll talk about different rescue options, how to develop a rescue. Again, when AMSA has created a brochure and a poster for this. So if you scan the QR code, you can see the poster and it'll give you a summary of each of those parts. And you can, if you're using the fall, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're using a fall arrest system, you can post this poster as a general reminder. Again, this is a refresher of training people have already received. And like follow or travel restraint systems, the employer must provide the system. The employer and the supervisor must ensure the system is used and used correctly. And the worker must actually use the system. And the employer must ensure that those suitable anchors are supplied. We do require a fall protection plan. Again, like I've discussed before, if you're less than three meters, may not be strictly required, but you will need to know what equipment to use, how to use it, so you need some form of a plan. The best practice would just be to complete the whole plan. And you need detailed training to use all that equipment. So our last option is these other effective controls that OHNS stated, if we can't use guardrails, travel restraint, or fall arrest, we are allowed to use other equally effective controls. But what does that actually mean? So one term that's commonly misunderstood or misapplied is fall restrict. This is for wood pole climbing only. So that's not going to apply to us at an aquatic center. So we don't want anything to do with fall restrict. There, if you're working on a fixed ladder or a climbable structure, so if you're working on a ladder or any other structure at a height of three meters, 10 feet or more, some kind of fall protection is required. Technically, if you're only climbing up and down a ladder, you don't need a fall protection system. But per the ladder regulations, there likely will be a ladder cage or some kind of ladder climbing system. So if that's provided, you need to make sure you use the ladder climbing system. So examples of fall protection you could use with a ladder would be a vertical rigid rail attached to the ladder rungs, a vertical lifeline that's attached at the top of the ladder, runs down the ladder, or some kind of alternate fall protection. Maybe there's an overhead beam that you can attach an anchor and an SRL to. Um, that's gonna be very site specific. If you're using a portable ladder, same as for Fixed ladders, if you're working at a ladder over a height of three meters or 10 feet, a fall arrest system is required. The regulations specifically state that if you're climbing up and down, no fall protection is required. And they do have a caveat that you may work without fall protection if all of these following conditions apply. So if a fall arrest system is not reasonably practicable, so it's not feasible, and it's a light duty task of short duration. And the center of worker's center of balance is at the center of the ladder. And the worker maintains three points of contact. So if you meet all those conditions, you may be allowed to work without fall arrest system. Uh, still, best practice would be use a fall protection system. And anytime it's practicable, you have to use it. Another option is safety nets. And so this is only allowed for leading edge work. Leading edge means where the edge of a floor or roof is being constructed and its location changes. So you're laying down roof decking or roof sheet would be a good example. And in this case, you're gonna have a safety net below that area. If a worker falls, they fall into the net. So likely not applicable to any of our aquatic environments. 
If you do happen to use it, it needs to be drop tested in accordance with US OSHA or certified by a professional engineer, and the workers need to be trained. Another option is control zones. So these are codified in the regulations. They're only allowed to be used if the surface is sloped less than four degrees towards the edge. They need to be at least two meters wide, and they cannot be used on skeletal or frame structures. Um, so basically, it has to be you know a roof or a flat surface where there's no skeletal structure you can fall through. So the control zone is that two meter wide width from the edge to, in this case, we've got you know a flagged market. And so if you're working farther from the edge than the width of the control zone, so you know, you're not within that two meter area, then no fall protection is required because you're outside of the control zone, further inside of the roof or the floor area. And if you're working within two meters of the edge of the control zone, so if your control zone is two meters wide and then you're another two meters from that, so four meters from the fall hazard edge, if you're within that area, the control zone needs to be marked with a raised warning line. So that'd be something like you see here where they would use posts or pylons with a line with flagging tape or little flags. That's your raised warning line, so you don't approach with them. And then our last option is just procedures instead of using any kind of equipment, which is defined in the regulations as well. So if fall protection is not, equipment is not reasonably practicable, this is only allowed if you're installing or removing fall protection equipment. So that could be, like I talked about earlier, what's your plan for installing a temporary guardrail? It's allowed if you're doing roof inspections, if you're doing emergency repairs, or if you're doing at height transfers between equipment and structures. So there's very few limited cases where you can use some kind of safe work procedure without any equipment. But likely, you need some form of equipment like we've discussed in the proceedings. So in conclusion, we've talked about a fall protection plan and training. We talked about the hierarchy of controls with that inverted pyramid, with elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. And then we talked about the different types of fall protective systems. So we have guardrails travel restraint systems, fall arrest systems, and then our other controls. So I'd like to remind you, there are other resources available online. There's the AMSA website. There is going to be one more webinar. In addition, you can also go and rewatch the previous webinar and this webinar will be posted. And the third webinar will be uh, May 30th from 11 to 12 o'clock. Again, I've got a QR code. If you want a quick link to the AMSA website, you can scan that out and see directly there. You can register for the next webinar. You can review the material they've got online. And there are also some training options. So AA, RFG, and AMSA have created a program certificate. They've got four options. One that may be particularly valuable is the Aquatic Safety Operator course, uh, but they also have an Arena Safety Operator, building maintenance safety operator, and a parks and sports field safety operator. So all of those courses will give you more in-depth training and knowledge of the different safety practices, the different types of equipment, um, and all kinds of safety operations and practices you need to implement. And then there's also in-depth fall protection training. And there's a variety of levels. Some examples would be just general fall protection for a user, but you can also do inspector training or competent person training, which will just give you more um, in-depth knowledge in inspecting equipment and then competent person for kind of setting up, developing plans, more of those things. So my contact information, uh, the information for high engineering, you can give us a call and scan the QR code or go to our website. Let's just submit area for questions and comments. And here's AMSA's contact information. So again, you can give them a call. You can also contact the website. The information's on there. At this point, I'd like to open the floor to any questions and say thank you for listening.